Hello and welcome back to Typical City. Spurs are the visitors this weekend. Those horrible Spurs. Those... Oh, 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 spurs. <laughs> you know what I mean, City fans? I think you know what I mean. I don't need to explain it more than that. That's, that's enough explanation. Spurs. They always seem to do us lately. Five out of the last seven Premier League games have ended in a Spurs victory. Although we did kind of shake that voodoo, that bogey team image that Spurs seem to have over us last season. 2-0 down at halftime. You're thinking, here we go again. Turned it around to win the game 4-2. So have we? Have we shaken that voodoo that Spurs seem to have over us? That recent voodoo, at least, in the last four or five years. We've always struggled against them. Haven't even scored a goal at their place. And I mean, honestly, it's not the team I look forward to playing. So I am feeling a little bit nervous from this one. Mainly because it's following on from a run of games that haven't really been too glistening in quality or, or, or assertiveness and assurances for City fans that we are about to go on a winning streak. You know, it doesn't fill me with confidence because we drew to Chelsea, we drew to Liverpool. We The Chelsea game was an anomaly to me. I thought that was a one-off. The Liverpool game, we should have made it 2-0. We should have got a second or third goal in that game. The RB Leipzig game, we're going 2-0 down at half-time and it takes a, a flurry of quality in the final 30 minutes. But that first 60 minutes was just atrocious. It was atrocious. Really worrying as a City fan. But this kind of is the perfect game to shake those cobwebs off and get back to winning ways and convincing winning ways. The thing is, Spurs will be coming into this nervous as well. I believe that, that they've got problems of their own. The injury list is through the roof. I'll get onto the team news shortly. I mean, if you're a Spurs fan, I mean, that. not many people as rival fans allow the opposition to have excuses. But, I mean, if you're a level-headed City fan, you look at the Spurs injury list, you think, yeah... I mean, that, that's a proper injury list, that is, isn't it? They, they could field a team with players that are in the medical staff room, you know, in the medic, on, the, on, the, on the bench in the medical room. I mean, honestly, I, I do feel for them in that regard. But, you know, you beat what's put in front of you. They, would they feel for us? Probably not. They'd say, well, they've got all that money. They should buy whoever they want. They buy whatever they want and they spend all this money. That's the, the if City have an injury, that's what gets said. Whereas it's all going to be about Madison's being injured. Whereas Kevin De Bruyne's injury, we're not allowed that as an excuse. That's not allowed as an excuse as a City fan. But when it comes to Spurs and their actual long list of injuries, I get it. I get it. That's, that's a mega list. So uh, it's going to be a really, really interesting game looking at this game. I mean, Postacoglu as well, he could be... I mean, what a loving we saw at the start of the season. The start of the season with Postacoglu was... I heard nothing but positive words and very, very comforting adjectives being used to describe Postacoglu. And I mean, I'm a big fan of him. I think he's obviously very much around the psychology of the game, the psychological aspects involved in football, confidence, the feel-good factor, the spirit of the game. Tactically, I don't think he's inept by any stretch of the imagination. A little bit wild, a little bit gung-ho. We saw his high line against Chelsea with nine men. Mental, to be honest. I, I thought it was mental, but some people call it brave, or some people call call it uh, mental. I don't know. It's it's it lost them the game, and it all, but it entertained the masses at the same time. You know, so it's like he does seem to get a lot of love. Postacoglu, personally, I think it's the Australian accent. I think it's the Australian accent because I think everyone loves an Aussie, don't they? Those oh, the rapscallions, those guys. Oh, you love them. They're all friendly, aren't they? All the Australians. But if you slap a Eastern European or a Russian accent on it, you're terrified. You're terrified of any words that come out of his mouth. It's like you could say anything as an Aussie. You can say anything you want. But if you say, "I'm going to fucking stab you" in a Russian accent, terrified, terrified. But if you say it as an Aussie, as a, as Postacoglu, oh, I'm right. I'm going to fucking stab you. Oh, no, you're not. You silly sausage. No, you're not. Oh. see what I mean? It doesn't work. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't fill me with fear. The Australian accent makes you very lovable because they're rap scallions, aren't they? And I feel like that's a lot of the love for Postacoglu. When in reality, is he that lovable? He seems like a nice guy, don't get me wrong, he seems like a nice guy, but I mean, tactically, I think he's there for the taking. There's some interesting tactics that are good, there's some other tactics that I think, you know, they, it's a little bit too gung-ho for my liking. I, I think they've been exposed. I thought they were by far the better team against Villa, should have won the game, but going over the, over the top with attacking tactics, with an injury-riddled team cost them the game. They went for it so hard that they completely neglected the other end of the pitch and conceded silly goals, and City can expose them. The thing with City right now is we're not exactly 
like tight and tight at the back, are we? We're shipping goals as well more frequently than I than I feel comfortable with. And it's unfortunate, but uh, Kulachevsky is the one we've got to watch for. And Son, those two in particular. I mean, Kulachevsky scored two in his last visit to the Etihad. Son's got our number. He always seems to score a worldie against us. You just want a clinical Erling Haaland to be all firing on all cylinders. The man who gets 40 Champions League goals in 35 Champions League games and 50 Premier League goals in 48 Premier League games. Just, just that. Just that records just ridiculous just stupid it's stupid records from Erling Haaland the man is incredible he has been missing chances though lately and I mean it's it's so harsh to criticize a man with a record that I just described to you but in reality some of these games he could have been getting hat tricks and beyond hat tricks four or five chances per game he's been getting clear-cut ones at times that you think He's come away with a goal, great, and it has helped us win the game, also great. You just want to get a little bit closer to last season's form where literally everything he hit found the back of the net. This year, not so much, but still, I think he's firing reasonably well. You know, better than any other striker in the world. Do you know what I mean? So put it put it in that perspective. You think, well, why, how, how is this man criticising Erling Haaland? It's just because of the chances he's missing that's bothering me a little bit. I just feel like there is going to be a team one of these days that's going to get an absolute spanking thanks to Erling Haaland and he'll find the back of the net with every one of his shots. No, and that day could be Sunday. I am doing a watch along as well, so come and join me for that. That's going to be a good one. 4.30 UK kickoff time. I'm excited for it. I'm excited, but nervous. I'm nervous. Now let's look at team news as well because I do want to be fair on Spurs here because, I mean, Perisic... Bensancourt, Phillips, Whiteman, Madison, Van de Ven, Richarlison, Solomon, Saar. That's a, almost a full team. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine players out. One of them is suspended as well. Romero makes it ten. Ten players they've got out. One through stupidity, to be honest. That suspension was fully deserved against Chelsea. He's finally uh, going to get rid of that suspension with his final game of the suspension being against City at the weekend this Sunday. So hopefully Basuma's back. That's a massive positive for Spurs. Basuma coming back into the midfield, he'll likely start. Whereas City have only got Nunes and the long-term injury of Kevin De Bruyne. Stones, who's been on the bench recently, um, Pep sort of hinted that he might get some minutes against Spurs, whether he starts or not. I think his indication and the words that he chose to, to use probably indicates he'll might be on the bench for this one. He said he's very, very close. He's, he'll be with us, is the words that he used. To me, that probably indicates he's going to start on the bench. I'm okay with that. I'd rather do that than risk John Stones because I think long-term we need him over the course of the season. We can't ha keep having a John Stones who's in for three games, then out for four games. We can't have that. Make sure he's fit. Don't rush him back. Make sure he's 100% fit, match ready. Get him into a game like this. Give him the final half an hour of this game, for example. Hopefully we're winning by that point. But, I mean, even if we are winning, these two teams, Spurs and City, have been throwing away leads Stupid leads. We took the lead against Chelsea. We took the lead against Liverpool. Spurs took the lead against Wolves. They took the lead against Chelsea. They took the lead against Villa. You know, they're throwing away leads, both of these teams. So I don't think this is going to be a, a, a game for, the, uh, for anyone who's thinking it might be a ball fest. I think there's going to be some goals in this game. Leaky defences and two teams that love to give it a go. Attacking football. So I think this is going to be an unbelievable game. My prediction, I'm going to go for 3-2. To City, and I'm not confident about that prediction whatsoever. <laughs> I just have no idea, but my, if I pull a number out of the hat, 3-2 is what I'm going for. Let's have a look at my predicted starting 11. I'm going to start with Spurs. Vicario's going straight in net. Their back line is in big trouble, you know, because they're playing two full-backs. Emerson Royal and Ben Davis have been playing centre-back for them in Van de Ven and Romero's absence. And if that doesn't scream a very enjoyable day for Erling Haaland, then I do not know what does, because he should be exposing these two. They are good players, don't get me wrong, but they're out of position too, as well, that have to communicate with one another as, uh, as, as two fullbacks playing in centre-back. That's Erling Haaland's breakfast, and they're not the most physical guys either. They are shorter than what Erling, the typical centre-backs. They're shorter, they're less physical, they're more technical. Erling Haaland should be bullying these two centre-backs, in my opinion. I think this is the perfect game for Erling Haaland to score some goals. 
But at left back, you're going to see Udogi. Along, uh, alongside him will be Ben Davis, and then in the middle, um, Emerson Royale, who I, I can't stress enough how much those two need to get exposed. Pedro Porro is going to be in at right back, most likely. Again, City player links or history with City at least in front of them you could go with Hoiberg for that physicality but with Postacoglu being the manager physicality and protecting are those words that bother him he's much more of a technical manager he's more about scoring goals than preventing goals Hoiberg's your man really in defensive midfield for being solid in the middle of the park assured preventing goals I don't think he'll go for Hoiberg because of those things I've just described I, I think Postacoglu is going to go for it and in that regard I think he's going to put Lo Celso in the middle um, alongside Lo Celso will definitely almost definitely be Basuma who's been brilliant before his suspension such a quality player sitting in front of them in defensive midfield Kulachevsky is going to be at number 10 most likely not his most preferred position because of Madison's absence though he kind of has to go in there because the options outside of Kulachevsky are not as not good enough. Not good enough as a number 10 for Spurs. So I do think Kulachevsky is going to be in there. He does prefer to play on the right and court. Plays his best football on the wings. But I do think with him playing uh, in in uh, the number 10 role is, is Spurs' his best option. Ahead of them is Son, of course. Um, and then Johnson's likely going to be on the right again, which, I mean, I think he's a good player. I think he's on the up and up. Johnson, really good looking player. Not physically, just as a footballer. You know, I don't float that way. Brian Hill, moving on swiftly. Brian Hill is uh, a player that I'm unsure about. I've seen some really good football from him. He looks like a fresh talent. And I've seen him get caught well out of position. Some sloppy touches in the process. So my opinion isn't established yet on Brian Hill. But I think there is a potential player in there. He looks decent, but... I think uh, I'm not convinced yet, not convinced yet. How Spurs play out from the back is really interesting as well. It's not too dissimilar to how City play out the, from the back. Kulachevsky pushing up along, getting close to Son to offer some uh, link-up play between Son. Lo Celso tends to push up a little bit and get out of Basuma's way. And they tend to have this diamond in the middle of their build-up play, building out from the back with Vicario being the base of the diamond. Basuma being the, the point of the diamond and Emerson Royale and Ben Davis normally would be Van, Van de Ven and um, Romero as the, the wide players in that diamond. Poro has been tucking inside as an inverted fullback, but they've also had moments where Udogi's been tucking inside at the same time with two inverted fullbacks purely for their build-up play and their network of passes. And as you can see, that makes them incredibly narrow. But Brian Hill and Bren Johnson, or whoever it's been on the wings, whether it be uh, Kulachevsky or whoever, Johnson and Hill in this case are going to be offering that width and creating space. And this cluster of players you see in the middle of the park will draw City in will lure City players into the middle of the park and create those wide plays. And with what City do at their opposite end of the pitch defensively, this could expose City, but City don't play too dissimilar themselves. So it's a case of who, who's what tactics. And it could come down to individual quality. And in terms of the, the 11 players that we have able to field compared to theirs, we should, should be winning the game if the tactics play out this way. I'm just going to pop them back into their position so it makes sense on paper for now. Um, but I think that's how they'll build up from the back. Won't be too dissimilar to that anyway, with Lo Celso playing alongside um, Bissouma. In terms of City, I think Edison's going to come straight back in with Ortega getting a, a, a much-deserved start. I do like Ortega. I just still think Edison's number one um, after Ortega's start against RB Leipzig in the week. Kyle Walker is almost definitely got to start. The only big question, I think, for City fans right now is Ruben Diaz. Because we're talking about Ruben Diaz now is... We, 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 were, we were talking about him like, a, oh, it's a bad day at the office. He had a bad game against Chelsea, and he did. And then it was like, hang on a minute, he didn't play very well against Chelsea. And then at that first half against RB Leipzig, we're talking about form now. We're not talking about bad days at the office. We're talking about bad form. He's out of form. Now, would Pep throw him? I say throw him. Would he be thrown under the bus if Pep wasn't to play him? I don't think so. I don't think that's that harsh. I still think Pep's going to stick with him. Personally, I wouldn't. I would play Nathan Ake in the middle with Gavardiol out left and Nathan Ake just going straight in the Ruben Diaz role and being the springboard for our defence. I'm happier with that. 
I don't think Pep's going to do that, though. I think he is going to stick with Ruben Diaz in the middle, alongside Manuel Akanji, who's probably going to have that role again um, of popping in and out of midfield, the hybrid role that we've all become familiar with. And I think it's got to be Nathan Ake on the left as a result. He is our number one defender right now, certainly in form. He is our best tackler of the ball, one-on-one -on -one defender, immense. There's very little that gets past him. And he's likely going to have Johnson to deal with for the majority of the game. And I've got every confidence that he can deal with him in front of them. The issue is obviously John Stones as well. Would he start? Because he's going to be on the bench if he doesn't start. He is fit to, to play the game. But do you want to risk John Stones? I'm not sure it's the perfect idea to throw him straight into such an important game as well. Such an intense game. It will be such high intensity. Energy levels are going to be required in this game. And coming back from another injury, do you want to risk that? Maybe give him the last 20 minutes of the game. Hopefully we're already winning. But other than that, I think it's a big risk to start him in this game. In front of them, it's going to be the main man in the middle. Who had a terrible game against RB Leipzig, Rodri. Hopefully he's shaken that off and he's back to his uh, normal self. In front of them, Alvarez, who's been okay. Got the winner against RB Leipzig midweek. I think Pep's got a lot of faith in Alvarez. His work rate is uh, criminally underrated. I think he's, uh, not by City fans, but by rival fans in particular. Julian Alvarez, I think. He's not been at the same form he was compared to the start of the season, but he's still a, a threat. A major, major threat. And you know he's a fox in the box. We saw that against RB Leipzig. He didn't come on and play that well against RB Leipzig, but he got his goal. Right place, right time, back of the net. We won the game thanks to Julian Alvarez. So I think he deserves a start again. Erling Haaland is likely going to be going up top, but behind them... Pop him in now, seeing as I've said his name. Uh, Phil Foden is going to be... Is he there? Or is he going to be on the right? That's another area of the pitch that's usually up for debate. Are you going to put Bernardo Silva in the middle and Phil Foden on the right? Or Phil Foden in the middle and Bernardo Silva out wide? Personally, I think he's going to go with Phil Foden on the right and play Bernardo Silva in the middle. And then on, out on the left, I'm going to go for Jeremy Doku, who came on and proved what a player he is against RB Leipzig. I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that he comes on and City win the game. You know the game when it starts, it won't end up looking like this. It'll look something more like this with City. What's interesting with City right now is what Kyle Walker's doing because there's been times when Foden's been pushing up here and Kyle Walker's been down here and Doku's obviously been up there. We've had Bernardo Silva in there, Alvarez in there. And uh, Kyle Walker's been right out here, and obviously Erling Haaland up here with Rodri and Akanji here. And we've had these two. We've had two at the back. And that scares me, and that's really exposed. And as I showed you earlier, the diamond that Spurs play and the ability to hit this system on the counter-attack worries me. It worries me, and in particular, these two players exposing the width. Son and Kulachevsky as well, lethal, lethal on the counter-attack. Do we want to see Kyle Walker go in as far forward as that? I would feel much more secure knowing that Kyle Walker and Nathan Ake were doing something more like that and we had more of a triple sort of springboard to bounce our playoff from the back. And Kyle Walker just let Alvarez and Phil Foden do their thing on the right-hand side of the pitch and stay out of their way because he's much more suited to preventing counter-attacks, Kyle Walker. And they have the ability to hit as hard on the break Spurs do. So we have to be so mindful of that and not really go for that two at the back when we have the ball. I mean, it's brilliant to watch some of the possession-based football we play, but the risk that comes with it in this game might be too high. But what do you think, Blues? That completes the preview. Get your predictions in below. I've gone 3-2 City. What's your predictions? I want to hear them. Like and subscribe. Typical City is the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. This is Typical City now. Holding up Silver. 